Welcome everybody to Life Fellowship. Over the past few months, we've had several conversations. Kenny and I had one last week, and they all have kind of a similar theme. Midtown is a fabulous doctrine teaching church. But sometimes I fear at Midtown we get so much doctrine, we don't get time to really absorb it and internalize it and live it. We get head knowledge, but it doesn't become heart knowledge. And Anita and I do a lot of counseling and discipling. I've talked with Kenny and others that are seeing the same things. We counsel people on marriage, on financial counseling, helping, but we often see people that have a, a common thread of these in that they lack the biblical submission and willingness to accept what they're being taught. Without a correct reverence and biblical structure, it just doesn't work. And I think we've seen that in, in counselees, we've seen that in disciples. For example, somebody comes for marriage counseling, their life's a mess. They also have money problems, they also have kid problems, they also have uh, problems in other areas. It's not just one area. And it's because they just don't get it. They're not connecting with what we're teaching here. And we've learned in these cases that the presenting problems are often not the root problem. That's something Jonathan teaches us over and over in counseling class. What's the base level problem? And the problem is when they fail to submit to God and live biblically structured lives, their lives go into chaos. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Here in Life Fellowship, we have lots of disciplers. We have quite a few people who do counseling. We also have people in our fellowship that are struggling. So today I want to do just kind of a fairly simple addition to what Kenny has taught us in Colossians before, but kind of focus the application on the importance of this lordship and living a biblically structured life once we're saved and plugged in. This isn't going to be new to most of us, but I think it's something that we're all going to kind of think about, okay, how do we apply this to our disciples? How do we apply this to our counselees? If we're still struggling, how might this impact me? Why am I still struggling after being saved for several years? So if you would please turn to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to build on what Kenny taught us a while back, but we're going to make the application of, of how do we deal with these people that God has given us that need his wisdom but just aren't really accepting it. Now, you remember Paul wrote the book of Colossians around 61 AD during his first imprisonment in Rome. He'd never been to Colossae personally, but he wrote this beautiful letter to them and it includes some of the highest praise of God and puts him in his position as much or better than any other book in the New Testament. Paul had likely heard from Ephratus, the leader of the church, that the church of Colossae was under attack from false teachers who were denying the deity of Christ as God. So Paul focused the book on Christ's preeminence and sufficiency in all things, the very things that, at least by their actions, we see counselees struggle with. In Colossians 2, Paul makes an amazingly strong statement that we'll expand on through chapter 3. It says, As therefore you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Consider for a minute, how do believers receive Christ? Certainly we are saved by faith. But then think about what additional must be included to walk in him. And that's where we're seeing the struggles. Notice that Paul uses the Lord's full title here, Christ Jesus the Lord. We're going to see more on this as we continue. So let's talk about lordship for a minute. We'll start in Colossians 3.1. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. 
when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. First thing Paul points out here is Christ's position. He sits at the right hand of God. He's the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the creator, the savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. If you remember Romans 10 says, it should be on the board, it says, what saith then the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth into righteousness and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. Look what verse 9 says. Confess Lord Jesus. Lord means master, ruler, king. This is a believer's proclamation that they're accepting salvation and the leadership of Jesus Christ in their life. And this is where Anita and I often see failures in those we counsel and even some we disciple. They have a faith in the death, burial, and resurrection. They've prayed a prayer, but they've never given in to the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. They are saved, but they're not surrendered. They are not submitted, and they're definitely not committed. Notice the first word of the verse, if. In these circumstances, and we just had a counseling situation recently, where we had to ask, you know, tell us about your salvation. How did you get saved? This person's so far off from the Lord's ways that we really questioned, are you even saved? And, and typically when we've done that, is even as gently as had, people get all offended, well, of course I'm saved, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, but your actions don't show that you're following the Lord Jesus Christ. You're here for counseling. Your life is a mess because you're not giving into the Lordship and you're not following what we know is the perfect plan of God. So you have to ask, are they really saved? Now, no one's 100% perfect at Lordship, but I think all of us disciples and counselors need to really take take note of our counselees or our disciples overall heart attitude we have had count, uh, disciples we've had counselees that come in who have total resistance to what's being suggested as change even though it's straight from the bible and we're realizing that sometimes discipleship fails for the same reason people are coming because it's popular here they're coming because it's the thing to do, but they really don't have a hard attitude to become servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Counselees come in with the biggest messes in the world, and there's specific Bible verses that can help them straighten that out, but they reject them. So when somebody refuses to accept lordship and fails to accept the Bible as their guide for life, their life can turn into ruins. Think about the people you teach, the people you lead. If they're saying yes, but, that's not lordship. The problem isn't their problem. The problem is they don't yield to God. If they say yes, Jesus, that's lordship. We can give a struggling married couple all the verses on how to be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. We can talk about love and respect. But if they're not willing to give in to lordship, None of that works. I've told this discipleship story before. Mark and Carla were, were given to us as disciples, and after they got over the shock that they had to come see some geezers that lived over in Kansas, and why in the world were we ever assigned to these guys, we started going through the lessons, and, and at some point early on, Carla just looked at us. We were, we were helping them with some marriage things. They're newly married. We were helping them with, with some of the life things. At some point early on, Carla just looked at us and said, well, if the Bible says it, we have to do it. And Mark nodded. And Anita and I looked at each other and went, this is going to work out great. That's the heart attitude we need. 
But we've also discipled and counseled many that that's not the attitude. There's always a yes, but. There's always a reason the Bible doesn't apply to them. There's always a reason they're different. Interestingly, some of those people are the most prideful people in the world, and they just know more than everybody else. And yet they're coming begging for help at the feet of the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but not yielding to him. Remember what Christ said. Luke 6, 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? In John 14, 55, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. In Luke, he said, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. James added to that, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So I think at times we've tried over and over to help someone by giving them counsel and verses they need to correct the problems that are obvious and presenting without really evaluating what's the deep, deep, deep hard attitude to accepting God's counsel. Look at the next part in verse 1. It says, seek those things which are above. This is the transformation, the plan that God has for every believer. And people generally, think about this, people generally don't make decisions to make their lives miserable on purpose, right? That'd be a stupid thing to do. But they're deceived into thinking what they're doing is a better way, often a better way than God's way. (laughs) Something has them convinced that what God's way says isn't for them. Now, they may resist out of fear. They don't want to change. They may have things in their past, like abuse or an overbearing set of parents or other circumstances where they don't want to let go of control of their life. But there are reasons that people are choosing not to, to follow God and not to trust God, even though their their knowledge attitude is, I know the Bible's true. So they either choose solutions that are different from following Christ, or sometimes even worse, they bounce back and forth between following Christ and doing other stuff. And that never works. When we discover people like this, we disciples and counselors need to evaluate the situation. Is this person wicked or are they just weak? Are they teachable or are they truly closed? Do they listen and receive or do they argue? Examples, I was a former Catholic I thought I was saved. My wife truly got saved, and boy, did she, and then had the whole world pray for me, her heathen husband. And I got saved and and got put into discipleship. I was literally wet from being baptized, and Mark McGoy grabbed me and says, you need this. I'm signing you up for discipleship. And my disciple was so patient because I had question after question after question where clearly the Bible didn't agree with what I had been taught before. I was an idiot, Bible-wise. But I was willing to listen and learn. And it took a while, and he was very patient and very good, always taking me back. What does the Bible say about that? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Does baptism save you? Look at these verses. What does the Bible say about knowing for sure and not losing your salvation? Look at these verses in 1 John. Look at these verses in Romans 8. On and on. He was very, very good. But we've also had disciples that struggled for a while because they were just enveloped in different problems and all that. But after a while, it clicked, and they all of a sudden got it and did very, very well. And some of them are now great, great servants of our church. But we've also had others that had problems, and they just refused to change. They just, they just put up a wall. They weren't going to go there. They didn't want to deal with it. And often... Often with those people, we had to end discipleship 
early because they just weren't going to become disciples by their own choice. One of my disciples strongly believed in some wrong doctrine he found on the internet, and he, every time he showed up, he, he, was, he was wanting to point out that Midtown was wrong. That's never going to become a disciple. If that's the case, go find a church that teaches that baloney and at least submit and bear fruit there, right? Meetings became debates, not teaching opportunities. Anita had a lady that just flat refused to get baptized. Nice lady came, wanted to be discipled. Nope, I'm not doing that. Now, the good news is we want to give as much time as we can, as much grace as we can. We want to help them grow. Sometimes it takes time to grow. Quite a while later, that lady returned, got baptized, and finished discipleship. And we've seen that in several groups, several people. They, they sign up for discipleship because they're more or less talked into it by leadership, by friends, by whatever. They're not ready yet. But God works on them through the preaching every day that they come to church, through Bible reading, through whatever they get. And God can, God can conform them. But we have to decide, are they wicked or are they just weak? The weak we want to give as much time and care and love to as we can. Some of the people that are, and when I say wicked, I don't mean like satanic wicked, but I mean, are they just flat closed to teaching? Those are people that, that we have to really consider how much time do we spend on them when we have others we can be teaching. The result of lordship. If we get lordship right, everything else follows. And I'm beginning to think that this should be a much bigger focus as we start discipleship and counseling with people. Anita and I started counseling a new couple last week, and it's one of the first things we started to go to is, who do you say Jesus Christ is? What do you think of the Bible? And that's where we need to start with a lot of these people if they're, if, you know, if they don't agree with the Bible as their infallible word, they're not going to believe what we say about their problem from the Bible, right? When a person accepts that the Bible is true and God's instructions are true and will guide them to the best outcome, many, many decisions in their life are already made for them, aren't they? Many of the things people struggle with. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians uh, 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it as truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. Christ said, sanctify them through truth, thy word is truth. When a husband and a wife says, I'm going to obey the Bible, it's going to solve their marriage problems. It's going to solve their financial problems. It's going to solve their child-rearing problems. But without it, it doesn't work, does it? Most people that we see, when, when somebody denies the word of, of uh, God, it just does not work to spend all that time with them. We've got to unlock that vault before they're willing to receive the gold that's in it. C.S. Lewis said, there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, all right then, have it your way. And I think we've all been in that situation at times, haven't we? He, C.S. Lewis also said, and this kind of ties with this, aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And a lot of the problem with the people we counsel is they're stuck in the, focused on the earth and doing things the earthly lost man ways. Next, God's biblical structure for believers. Paul builds on first one. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ. Notice carefully, set your affection on things above. This is not a suggestion. It's a commandment. Too often Christians read verses like these and don't see them as commandments. They don't meditate on them, internalize them. They don't let them become a guide to their life. Also notice 
affection is singular. We say believers are commanded to make God our one priority. And it doesn't just say that for Arnold and Anita and Mark. It's every Christian. If you're saved, set your affection. This is my plan. But without lordship, these commandments don't work. And without the correct authority and a direction in life, turmoil results. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Think about all the people at Midtown, those of you that have been here a while. Think about the people that sit around us that have been here year after year after year after year and really have never done anything. Or the people that we only see on Sunday morning for just a few minutes and they're gone. Never see them again. Think about your disciples or counselees that have failed. So the Christian has to accept the new life goals. It says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Notice it says, Christ, who is our life? This is not stated ambiguous, ambiguously or as an option. It's redirecting our focus. 1 Corinthians 15, 41 says, There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So do you want to be a bright and shining star in eternity or do you want to be a dim bulb? That's what setting our affection on heaven does and that's what we need to teach our counselees. Long ago, as a lost married couple, Anita and I were focused on all the worldly stuff. We wanted a gigantic house. We, wanted, we, all, we had, at one time, nine cars, old, but they were kind of cool, some of them. You know, we wanted lots of money. And we, were, we were chasing all the stuff of the world. Then we got saved, and God redirected us, and it became, what does God want? Now, some of those things aren't bad if you do it right, but God has to be the focus, the key. Next, we see we need to work the, eliminate to work the, uh, eliminate the works of the lost. Colossians 3, 5 to 7 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which thing, things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when you lived in them. This is really similar to the, the in, uh, book of Ephesians, which shadows a lot of this. Entering God's plan includes killing off all these sins. And these are some pretty ugly sins, right? But you know what? This sounds like a who's who of what we see in counseling. Think about it. The first group deals with sexual sins and wrong relationships. We deal with these often. Many of these same words are used in Romans chapter 1. You know what that's all about. Second, we see covetous listed, worshiping something else more than God. Wrong thinking about power, possessions, and things. Leads to people going into debt in crazy ways. It leads to financial ruin. It leads to bad decisions. This is what we deal with every week in counseling. Under proper lordship, people would be more eager to eliminate these. There's always going to be the temptation, even for us Christians. But where's your heart? Where's your disciple's heart? Then we need to put off the old man. It says, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, lie, not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Put off here is cast away, like you'd throw out smelly trash. And this teaches us how to interact with others as we go about filling, fulfilling God's plan. And doing away with these allows us to bring, build strong relationships with each other and also with the lost. Then we see the Lord's commandment to put on the new man. It says, and you put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is no Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all in all. 
In this body, God's biblical plan includes for us to be renewed in knowledge. That requires an open heart, an open desire, a desire to change and become the new man. Also, once we're saved, we're no longer Greeks or Jews or or wandering barbarian Russian tribes. That's what Scythians are. Our race is now Christian. Our nationality is heaven. And we are one body in Christ with one mission. We will be very unhappy Christians if we don't plug into that plan. And Midtown is amazing, isn't it? The incredible mix of people that we have here and how well we get along because we're all members of God's family seated in heavenly places. One of the funniest things we used to do Hoops and Bible, have all the neighborhood kids come and play basketball on, on Saturday nights, and then we'd, we'd give the gospel, and some of them got saved. That's why there's all the big lights on top of the building there. This Kansas City Star came out and did an article about us. This lady comes out, and uh, she's talking to Andrew Ong and myself and a guy named Darren Fulcher, great-looking athletic black guy that's now going to the Lee Summit Church. And he's talking to, she's talking to the three of us and about... I don't know, 20 minutes into this this interview where she's trying to write her article, she looks at us and goes, are you an integrated church? (laughs) And Darren and I both kind of went like this, and Andrew goes, (laughs) pointing at the three of us and just grinning ear to ear. And it's like, we never consider ourselves integrated or not. That's never been something we even thought about, but yeah. And we got people from Asia and people from Russia and people from everything, but I don't know if we have any Australians yet. (laughs) But she's just like, oh, like that was some big new thing. Verses 12 to 17, we see the results of putting on the old man. We're not going to go into this so long. We're going to save some discussion time. Jonathan's going to come up. He has so much more experience than than I or any of us have. But we're going to discuss what it's like to deal with these people who refuse lordship and and how we can deal with them. So we're going to have some discussion time on that. Colossians 3.12, it says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any may have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which you are also called one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. This is the result of lordship, and following God's plan. Don't all those things sound good? Don't we want those? Shouldn't our disciples and our counselees want that kind of life? And notice that Paul wraps all this back around to the Lord Jesus and giving thanks to him for what he gives us by following his plan. Now our application how to live a biblically structured life. This is something that I think we all need to talk about with our young disciples, young counselees. Number one, they need to commit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every strong servant of the Lord I know at some point said, God, I am yours. Have it your way. Open the doors where you want me to go. Close the doors where you want me to stay out of. I am yours. Second, they need to accept and submit to the infallible word of truth. And this means obeying the Bible in good times and bad. This comes from faith that God is our Father. He will do what's best, even if it's hard for me. Many of our disciples don't have that attitude, and we really don't have a lesson on that. So I think it's just important as... As teachers, we teach that. 
then submit to the authority of the church. This is a hard thing for many people to do, especially in this culture where church is supposed to tickle our ears and make us feel good. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember them which have rule over you, which have spoken unto you in the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Ephesians 4, we all know, says it gives us the structure for the church. So we need to understand the chain of command at Midtown. Christ is our king. Sam is our general. Kenny and our other pastors are the colonels. The ministry leaders are the majors. The ministry workers are captains and lieutenants. And the new believers are the privates. Sam's been given a vision by the Lord to start a church in Midtown Kansas City and has chosen to fit us in to the plan to reach and make disciples here. Each Christian needs to do that. So what does that mean? And these are areas we see enormous struggle with people. Church attendance, not forsaking the assembly together. The church is the way God chose to to fulfill the Great Commission, and it's essential for successful Christian life. Interestingly, there's a very high correlation between people who don't attend regularly in the counseling office. Preaching from the pulpit is some of the best preaching we get. And God supernaturally can take a message from the pulpit and make it feel like it was written just for me, right? So if we ignore that, we don't get that, right? Jeff Adams, my my shepherd school teacher, he said one time, he goes, look, you're free to come sign up for counseling with me, but, but first of all, come to church service. Come to Sunday service, come to Sunday evening service. I'm going to teach you the same Bible verses there I would in my office. So there's nothing new. I'm not hiding things from you secretly just to give you, give you in my office. Sam has directed that Midtown members attend main service, a fellowship, prayer, and Bible study. Online works when we're in crisis situations like COVID, but think about it. A lot of these people say, well, I watch online or I'll listen during the week. That isolates you from praise. It isolates you from Christian relationships. It isolates you from ministry. It pulls your kids out of kid town. I mean, it's, it's just a disaster in every way. Ministry participation, we're all saved to serve. There is somebody who will only get saved and go to heaven if you do your job as a Christian. We need to teach this. They need to understand that. It's not just for them. Personal Bible study, the side you feed is going to take over. If you're not in your Bible, you're not going to be feeding the spiritual side. The, the, the wicked, fleshy side is going to take over. The number of counselees that we have sign up for counseling and come to us that are not reading their Bible is enormous. If you don't have a personal daily walk with God, it just doesn't work. Then we need to submit to God's structure for the family. Look at the next verses in Colossians 3. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it's fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. The husband is not more important or valuable than the wife to God, but he's been given the position as the head of the family. And husbands, we stand in judgment for the success or failure of our families. So the priorities for a Christian family, this is important for young Christians to understand. First is our relationship with God, then our spouse, then our kids. Then we have to work to support our family. Then ministry plugs in. Then family activities, then recreation. The number of people we hear say, oh, my kid had soccer on Sunday morning, so I didn't come to church, doesn't understand God's priorities. People are commanded to be part of this church. Do you realize 21% 
of Life Fellowship members are not here every week. Not because they're serving in praise, not because they're serving in hospitality, not because they're serving in the cafe. They just don't show up. Why is that? It's a huge failure of the husband to not get their family into church. Look at Ephesians 5.22, and you'll see why. Maybe a husband doesn't think his wife's all she should be. What's the Bible say about her as she pictures the church? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband's the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to the Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Husbands, maybe your wife isn't all she can be because you're starving over what God says she needs to be to grow as a wife. The washing of the water of the word. The same for your kids. A dad that gets busy on weekends and doesn't get his kids into church, that's child abuse. I mean, that's crazy. You know, the priorities for the wife, respect your husband, honor the position that God's given him, support your husband in all that he does, raise the children and be keeper of the home, and keep the priorities straight. We see a lot of problems here. Many moms, especially new moms, and some of it's totally understandable, value their children and, and serve their children and put them above the husband. That messes up the marriage. So we need to keep God's priorities our priorities. We need to teach our young disciples more than just what's in the lessons. That's something we always do. We did with Mark and, Cor Mark and Carla, Corey and Jeff all the others, teach them the life skills part of the Bible. How do you manage your home? How, who's, who's in charge of getting this family to church? And what, how do you get them there? How do you keep your priorities straight? No soccer, a big soccer tournament does not mean you don't go to church. Now, yes, illness, vacations, we get breaks. But 21% of our, our life fellowship isn't here today because they got something better to do. So in conclusion, lordship is critical for the success of every Christian. To be a successful Christian, we must each submit to the lordship and then live by the biblical structure God prescribes. And this lordship is essential in the lives that we counsel and disciple. And I think we teachers need to spend more time and give more attention to this as we do that. So Jonathan... Please come up and, and share your wisdom. You've seen so much of this for so many years. Please help us. All right. While Larry was talking, I couldn't help but think about what's going on in um, my life this week. Uh, so uh, my grandmother... Um, Blanche Carter is 96 years old, and over the course of the last few months, she's been having many strokes, and the last one really took a toll on her, and so over the last few days, she's been declining significantly, and uh, I got to sit with my grandmother, who was in the car when my mom and dad, who were teenagers when they had me, <laughs> Uh, they were rushing to the hospital. My grandmother was in the car, and she's been in my life, uh, you know, every step of the way. And uh, I got to sit with her on Wednesday. She's sitting there in her chair, and she's kind of in and out. And uh, we got to talk about her life, you know. Um, I just got to tell her how thankful I am for how she loved me so well and how she led our family in so many ways. She lost her husband when my mom was 16 to brain cancer. He was abusive and alcoholic. Um, she raised my mom and my mom's brothers uh, with integrity and taught them uh, the way of the Lord. She taught me uh, about Christ my whole life, and 
just got to share that with her, and she shared some things with me. She said, I didn't live my life the way that I should. You know, there are times where I didn't trust God with what he was doing, you know, in my life. I couldn't see past my circumstances. And we got to work through that, but she, at the end of it, she said, thanks be to Jesus Christ because of his grace and how he, he loves us despite our insufficiencies. And so I see this woman, you know, on the, the very edge of this life, the veil, this thin veil that stands between us and eternity, and she's just standing right on the edge of it. I was there with her last night, and she's no longer speaking. They said she probably has, you know, a few hours left. And, and she said, don't worry, you know, I'll see you soon. Um, you know, I got her King James Bible. I'm the only one left in my family that reads the King James Bible. I have my grandmother's King James Bible. <laughs> and I'm reading through this King James Bible, and in the margins of my grandmother's Bible, just wisdom, decades and decades of wisdom that she has mined from God's Word, just sitting at His feet. In the back of that Bible, after the book of Revelations, there's a story that she wrote. The only reason I know it's there is because um, she detailed her, her uh, funeral. She wrote it all out. This is what she wants. And at the end, she shared the story. And she says, I want you to share what's on page 313 of my Bible. And it's a story about me. We're driving from... Kansas City to Mississippi, which is where my grandmother lived, and, and I told her, hey, Grandma, when we die and we go to heaven, we need to find a meeting place. You'll probably die first, but if I die first, we need to meet at the tree of life. And so, we'll be able to, there'll be a lot of people there, so we'll know where to meet. And these are the kind of conversations that I had with my grandmother my whole life, just about God and what he was doing and the reality of eternity. And I share all of that, okay? Because what Larry shared with us today in Colossians 3 is the perfect blueprint of a biblically structured life. But what we see throughout Scripture, and this is what I see as a counselor is that that blueprint is often something that we fall astray from. If you've ever built a building, if you've ever built a house, you have this perfect blueprint. This is exactly what we need to do. And if we execute this, then our life is going to look this way, right? There's going to be fruit. But when you get into it, you know what I'm talking about, Gordon. You get into it, it's like, this isn't working out the way that we planned. And those are the people that we see in our counseling offices. These are, the, these are the disciples that we have, people who, you know, were born into this world, intended for a garden, but without the garden. So we have all of these legitimate needs that God gave us, and yet they're not being met. And so then we find all kinds of little things that we can do to try to meet our God-given needs in illegitimate ways. That is the human condition. And what bolsters that whole thing is fear. You look in scriptures, it says, fear not, fear not, fear not. How many times? In, in our Bible, it says, fear not, 63 times. And yet, what do we do all the time? We live in a spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7. We haven't been given a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And the truth is, when we're sitting with someone in a discipleship relationship, we're sitting with counselees and we're sitting with married couples who are distressed and being torn asunder. When we get down to the root of it, and, and, and Larry was sharing this, when we get down to the root, there is a spirit of fear. A spirit of fear. And that fear leads to us to reach to all kinds of things and it blinds our eyes to Colossians 3. So when I think about that, and, and one of the things that really comes to mind is as we're sitting there and we're discerning with the Spirit, we're sitting with somebody and it's like, God, what is it that this person is wrestling with? We have to know their heart. So, so Larry was saying, are they wicked or are they weak? In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it talks about how we discern the hearts of different people. There is 
unruly people. Right? These are people that come in and they're just opposed to the idea of living for the Lord. They, they've been presented with God's truth. They've been presented with the blueprint, but they're like, you know what? I just want to do it my way. I'm going to do it my way. And that happens. Now, I, think, I think the scriptures lay it out. There's three different heart postures. And I would say that's maybe a third of the time, maybe less. What I see more than that are people who are feeble-minded. Scriptures tell us that we need to comfort the feeble-minded. So someone who's feeble-minded, this is somebody who they're, they're faint of heart. Their circumstances are so consuming that they don't know how to manage themselves. And this is where we find ourselves a lot of times. I, don't, I, I want to do right, I just don't know how to do right. And sometimes, you know, it takes people a long time to figure out how to do right. I mean, we, we see the man after God's own heart, David, right? David, he wanted to do right, but he got off track often, right? And still at the end of the li- his life, we, we know him as the man after God's own heart. And so what is sanctification? What does it look like for us, you know, to, to not only walk in the Spirit, for there to be fruit in our life, but then as that starts to happen, okay, what does it look like for us to then pour into the people that God has placed in our path? So I want to I wanna start a conversation with you guys this morning with the time that we have, and just to discuss what, is it, what does it look like to ha- help or to, to guide or to aid people in the process of sanctification. So before I do that, I want to read to you 2 Timothy 2.24. This is the quintessential counseling posture, the shepherd's heart, okay? 2 Timothy 2.24, and the servant of the Lord, okay? That's, that's the, the, the discipler, right? That's the counselor. The servant of the Lord must not strive. Not only are we not fighting or warring with the person we're leading, but we're also not fighting within ourself, okay? That we must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, so to the person that we're counseling, and we're apt to teach, meaning we're ready to teach them. We're patient and in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, in verse 26, and that they may, be co- they may cover them, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What does it look like for us to do that? What do you guys think? What does it look like to help walk alongside someone in the process of sanctification.